Uh, Mr. Engdahl, how are you doing? I'm glad that we were able to make this happen. A little bit of confusion there in terms of the, the, the timing, but I'm glad we're able to make this happen. People have been waiting for you to get back on the show. How have you been? It's been a while. It's been, I think, about yeah, a year. Uh, has it been that long? Okay. All right. I'm glad to be back with you. Yeah, good. All right. So my first question to you, uh, Mr. Engdahl, is uh, how, since our last talk, how would you assess Trump, both geopolitically uh, economically speaking, there's a lot of talk out there. Uh, I guess there's two sides of the coin. Uh, some see him as a neocon, sort of like Bush. There are others who believe, you know, he's truly, you know, trying to dismantle the deep state. Where, where are you at with Trump these days? I basically haven't changed my my view of the Trump project. I call it the Trump project. You can't look at him as a uh, sentient being with his own agenda. Uh, the Trump project is basically not the deep state, but the deeper state behind behind the deep state, behind the bureaucrats and so forth in Washington. Uh, the powers that be, the old families that, that really uh, own the, the mega banks of Wall Street, they own the military industrial complex, they own the Congress, they own the presidency since uh, they assassinated JFK back in the 60s. Uh, the Trump project, the basic geopolitical problem that the powers that be faced in the last five or six years or 10 years is the fact uh, that they're a bankrupt uh, world hegemon bankrupt economically they've outsourced all the crucial industries to china to uh, asia in general to mexico what, what will you and they uh, have dumbed down the education of the american uh, population and now they're left with a declining influence in world politics they're uh, their policies toward Russia, toward China, toward anyone who tries to speak up toward Germany, toward Europe, uh, has forced those countries, especially Russia and China, to come more closely together. So right now, Trump is the vehicle. It, it, I, I would say, given the constraints on, on the U.S. options or the the deeper state options, uh, Trump is doing a brilliant job for them. He's keeping everybody uncertain. The Chinese were initially off balance as to what this whole trade war tariff business was about. They thought it was about uh, the U.S. balance of trade. U.S. hasn't, U.S. Uh, Wall Street elite hasn't cared about the balance of trade since August of 1971 when they broke with the the gold dollar link. So uh, they, they've run trade deficits ever since. That's, that's an essence of, of the, the power of empire, if you want to call it that, or the power of hegemony. Mm. So the Trump project, now all, all of this noise about uh, you know, Trump and Russia, Trump and uh, uh, this or that scandal and so forth, it's distraction, it's diversion, it's deception, so that people aren't clear where things are going. You, 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 you turn on the news and all you hear is this banal nonsense about the uh, former FBI head Miller doing this and that, or turning this guy Manafort, or turning that guy, and uh, uh, you know, it's all deception, it's all nonsense, it's noise. So the real point is the trade war against China is absolutely strategic. It's in the Pentagon's uh, military posture document that came out in the end of last year, beginning of this year, where it named China and Russia as the two main rivals, not military challenges or dangers, but rivals, economic threats mm. to the continued American hegemony. Of, of, of these elites, not, not of America as a nation. These elites, have, or I don't want to call them elites, but these powers that be, they've destroyed the foundations, 
pretty much over the last 35, 40 years of, of the American industrial complex that was at one time when I was in my younger years and my youth, it was the greatest uh, economic uh, production machine that the world had ever seen. No longer. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, some of, uh, by the way, you can find uh, Mr. Engdahl's work at williamengdahl.com. Uh, and, you know, kind of staying along the same lines here, uh, and some of your more recent articles talking about, you know, the real stakes of U.S.-China trade wars behind the Anglo-American war on Russia. If we could uh, maybe follow up with your analysis uh, as it relates to China specifically, you know, being uh, ready uh, to have an alternative to the dollar. What do you see there? There's a lot of uh, individuals who, who kind of see China being the, 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 the model, if you will, for the new world order. Where is China and Russia at? Will we see more countries begin to move away from the dollar? And, and maybe uh, to kind of piggyback off of that, uh, what is the prospects of a stock market crash under Trump? Will he be the fall guy, perhaps, as some are suggesting? Okay. Uh, those are two uh, very loaded questions. Let me try my best. Yes. The, the Trump agenda on China is about preventing China the way they have acted to prevent any uh, developing country from becoming a modern industrial state-of-the-art technological competitor to the United States. Uh, with the small exception of Japan, which then they smashed down in 1989-1990 after the Plaza Accord in 85-86. Uh, uh, to prevent China from emerging as, as a rival to the United States. So it's aimed at something called China, Made in China 2025, which is a 10-point program that China will become a leading state-of-the-art industrial modern economy, no longer making screwdriver assembly for Apple iPhones, but actually making Huawei or ZTE or other Chinese made in China, patented in China with semiconductors and processors also made in China uh, technology. And I disagree with some of the 10 points uh, as, as not at all healthy for China or for the world, but the point is they're determined to go the next step as South Korea did uh, in, the, in the 70s and the 80s when they became one of the uh, Asian tiger economies. And now the United States has said, no, we don't allow you. We're, we're and I'm not talking about the American people, I'm talking about the, uh, the powers that be behind the Wall Street banks behind the military industrial complex, they said, no, we don't allow that. Right. We want only vassal countries who uh, we can loot and suck dry, like we did and loot and suck dry our own population here in America. We've robbed their pensions, we've bankrupted their cities, we've uh, stolen their homes in the subprime and the other real estate crisis of 2008, and uh, now we do that to the whole world through debt. It's a debt slavery system. So China is not about to take that sitting down. They're not ready, in my estimation, to replace the dollar as reserve currency, but there are enormous things that China can do if it holds to an alliance with other countries, especially Russia. And why do I say Russia? Not set aside ideology. The Chinese ideology internally, to my mind, stinks. Uh, it's, it's this old Communist Party top-down, you know, you're not thinking the right thoughts, we send you to a re-education camp and so forth. The problem they have is 1.4 billion people, if they start getting confused and angry, uh, the, the party, Xi Jinping and, and company, are, are terrified how to, how to keep that under control. So they resort to the methods that have proved somewhat successful in the past. Be that as it may, China as an economic factor in the world, combined with Russia as a military and economic factor in the world, the land space of Eurasia, as I wrote in that article you mentioned, 
the land spaces of Eureka, this, this is classical British geopolitics going back 110 years to 1904. Uh, the land power versus the sea power of America and Britain. And the Anglo-American world at this point could not, if they, if they get their ducks in a row and they do things the way they completely are capable of doing, uh, the Wall Street banks will be not able to deal with this challenge. So it requires a lot of flexibility on the part of China. I think they're capable of it. Are they doing it right now? 50-50, it's, it's a mixed bag. But the new Silk Road, that's a brilliant strategy. It's creating railroad links. It's creating deep port uh, transportation alternatives that the U.S. Navy cannot control as choke points for oil supplies, for trade routes, and so forth. And so that's where we are right now. And uh, the U.S. is no shape or form ready to make a military confrontation with either China or Russia. So they're doing it through this uh, sneaky means of the U.S. Treasury, uh, financial sanctions, trade wars, and so forth. Now, uh, and by the way, folks, you can find a great article, uh, Why the West Fears Made in China 2025, exclusively on uh, WilliamEngdahl.com. I encourage you all to get to that. Uh, and in speaking about fears, that, that basically ties in with my next question. What's with all of the demonization, if you will, coming from the more uh, Zionist uh, countries, uh, whether it's you know the United States, uh, UK? Um, what, what's going on there, in your opinion? There's obviously... Uh, I don't know how to put it in social media. You, you know, you've got uh, on one side of the fence, you've got the, the Arab countries kind of uh, with Russia. And then on the other side, again, you've got United States, Israel, UK, Saudi Arabia. It seems like sides are forming at this point. Uh, what do you make of all of the demonization? And do, what's, what's your uh, updated opinion in regards to a potential full-scale war? Do you think uh, that is still a possibility? The, the Pentagon is not ready for a full-scale war with Russia and China combined. Simple as said. There's so much corruption in the Pentagon uh, military procurement machine. There's so much uh, uh, pork barrel and, and uh, incompetence and so forth inbred over decades of Cold War where you know nobody was ever thinking of using these weapons unless it would be against something like Grenada or uh, Iraq, which had no possibility to defend. Uh, but a real war against a real formidable military opponent, as Russia has demonstrated in, uh, in Syria over the last three years, the Pentagon is not ready for that. They, uh, so I don't see that as the immediate point on the agenda. That's why they're resorting to these financial sanctions and all these other means. Uh, hoping that uh, the oligarchs will break with Putin or, I don't know, Lord knows what. So, but they're also doing it with China at the same time. And this is the danger of the classical waging a war on two fronts at the same time against two very formidable adversaries. Right. And they're making them into adversaries. China did not pick that fight with the U.S., nor did Russia pick that fight with the U.S. The neocons, the... Uh, military-industrial complex, uh, they made a judgment back in 2014 that Russia was getting too assertive as a, as a sovereign nation by inviting Ukraine to join the Euro Eurasian Economic Union with Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, uh, and so forth. And they made a very attractive offer to the president of U Ukraine at that time. So the CIA, John Brennan, the knuckle dragger, and uh, and the uh, Biden Obama administration with Victoria Newland and company, they simply staged a coup d'état in Kiev in 2014 February, and hired snipers from Georgia, according to the information that's uh, available, and created complete panic and chaos in in. Uh, Maidan Square in February of 2014 that led to installing literally neo-Nazis, neo-Nazi parties in, in the, the government of, of Ukraine 
to break the link between Russia and Western Europe, especially Germany and Russia. Hmm. And that is classic Alfred Mackinder British geopolitics going back more than 100 years, as I said. And uh, with China, it's, it's the Wolfowitz doctrine. China and Russia are presenting a Eurasian challenge to the sole superpower dominance of this uh, creation called uh, Washington. Right. It's, it's not the United States. You know, the American people are blissfully ignorant of all this. They're not allowed to uh, get any news about anything real in the world. They just right. get this garbage from CNN or NBC or whatever, whatever you want. Uh, USA Today, I don't know what. Yes. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, actually, out here in the West. We're seeing a rise in what I'll just call conservative censorship. I'm often censored on any of the major social media platforms. As a matter of fact, I just got another strike on YouTube, a video basically exposing Zionism. Uh, go figure. Uh, and I, I wanted to see how you were holding up on that end to see if uh, there are any censorship uh, going on. Oh, yeah, yeah I have had... Uh... I did a very prominent uh, uh, interview with, with uh, an American alternative media uh, on my new book, uh, The Manifest Destiny, the, the uh, uh, yeah, Democracy is Cognitive Dissonance, Manifest Destiny is the title of the book. And it's uh, the role of the CIA creating these NGOs like National Endowment for Democracy, John McCain's Republican Institute, uh, the late unlamented John McCain, who's probably one of the most nefarious war criminals in the past century. Yes. Uh, and two hours after that interview about my book, I got a notice from uh, Amazon that uh, my book had been delisted because oh, of goodness. complaints from viewers and da 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 da. It was one of these algorithm robot nonsense things. And after several requests, please tell me what uh, you find offensive, and I will do my best to correct that. And so far, finally, uh, suddenly, uh, after several days or about a week, uh, the book was back up. But I have the feeling uh, it's, it's being damped and uh, all sorts of funny business are going on. Right. The tweets of my articles that, that my uh, website sends out to, uh, they're just down to one tenth of what they were. It's, it's all sorts of yeah. <laughs> you know, this is global fascism that we're yes. talking, about, Eric. Yeah, they're, they're... you know, ten years ago, nobody could imagine that anybody could touch the internet, uh, and now here they do it under this rubric of fake news against uh, Donald Trump and so forth. And they, private corporations, are getting away with murder. Yeah speech the constitutional uh, safeguard and so they're ripped to shreds there's a new internet law that the european uh, parliament passed last week if it goes into effect in the next months it will virtually end uh, most internet uh, linking to the two articles yes he'll you know kill the exercise of uh, free speech and, and uh, free exchange of ideas. Uh, that's something that's very serious. Yeah, it's very, very serious. Uh, you know, I've thought even over the last couple of weeks of leaving Facebook, yeah, it's really interesting that they've manipulated these algorithms to where, yeah, it seems like it's only going out to like 120th or 125th of what your normal subscribership would be. Um, I also find it funny that they will, on top of that, not only will they limit your posts going out, they will actually a uh, ask you to, uh, you know, run some kind of promotion. You got to pay ten bucks for it to go out to people. So it's kind of like an interesting little scam that got running between Twitter and Facebook. Oh, that's uh, great. Yeah, and th and then on top of that, you know, if we have to pause and ask the question, you know, can people like yourself, analysts, writers, podcasters like myself, and people just in general in journalism, however you want to put it, the media. Uh, you know, when do we get the whitewash? Are we ever, 
even going to be able to make a living in the future. They, they might just scratch us completely off the face of the earth. I mean, it's just, it's insane to think about. Um, but for the sake of, of keeping this moving along, I'm wondering uh, if you can break down a little bit more where NATO, EU fits into all this geopolitically, you know, this kind of struggle between the East and the West. And how are you guys doing out there in Germany? Germany is a disaster right now. The, uh, the leading families that determine policy in Europe, from the Vatican, from the present uh, Pope, I hesitate to use that term. but Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Francis, Society of Jesus. Uh, <laughs> They are pushing this uh, United Nations agenda of migration as a weapon of war. And it goes back to something called the kudenhof kalergi plan from the 1920s. It's designed to destroy nation state culture, nation state identity. One of the few voices in Europe that is outspoken and steadfast and principled against this in a, in a what I find a, a very credible way is, is the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, and he's vilified as a, as a fascist, as a destroyer of human rights and so forth, simply because he objects to the operations in his country, uh, the illegal operations of the foundations connected with an American billionaire named Soros. So, among other things, and he objects to being dictated by Brussels as to who the nation can allow to come in as potential citizens and who not. That is the essence of sovereignty. And if the European Union is about uh, destroying sovereignty, then they're not gonna they're not gonna make it. That's one reason that the majority of voters in England voted for the Brexit, because they feared losing sovereignty. Uh, completely to a bunch of unelected bureaucrats in Brussels who, by personal tendency, are uh, not exactly uh, positive human beings. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, you know, then, then I, I don't know how much you want to go into this, but the there are areas of major cities in Germany, because not just of... of immigrants, but because of terrorists, because right. of criminal gangs and so forth that have been let in under this no questions asked policy of the Merkel government. Mm. Uh, there are entire areas of Berlin, of Cologne, of Frankfurt, and major cities that the police are afraid to go in. Right. Yeah, no question about it. We, we, we see it over here in the West. And when I was talking with uh, a few other uh, geopolitical pundits out there, they say, Eric, you know, you don't really realize just how bad it is in some European cities. I mean, also Sweden falling apart, Paris, London, and it's just like, my goodness, you just see some of these videos, and it's like, it, it's turning into just like, uh, like a, a dump, uh, especially this, Paris. This is not an exaggeration. I, I live in the midst of this, and I can tell you, it's, uh, it's deliberate and it's designed to break down the cultural identity. It's, 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 it's like a cracking of a, of a, you know, several thousand years of European culture and history right. to destroy that and, uh, you know, replace it with, with something that can be like the new dark ages, you know? Yes. Yeah. All under the banner of multiculturalism, of course. Uh, I know you, you also yeah. wanted to get into uh, gene editing. Um, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I, I follow health. I, I do, you know, prepper related stuff. I obviously an anti GMO. So I've had uh, some, you know, analysts some pundits, you know, come on. We've talked about GMOs, Monsanto. First of all, you can give us uh, any of the latest uh, from Monsanto if you would like, but then also get into this uh, gene editing thing, which I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not overly familiar with. Okay. The, Gene editing is simply the new name for GMO. Okay, interesting. Bill, Bill, Bill Gates and his foundation, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, if she exists, I don't know. I've never seen a picture of her even. But uh, the, the foundation has been working for 10 years on financing this. So right away, 
since Bill Gates is one of the major shareholders in the Monsanto, which is now part of German Bayer, uh, Bayer Monsanto. Uh, gene editing is simply a different technology to uh, shoot something into the DNA of a plant or an animal or even a bacteria to change, they claim very precisely, the advocates claim very precisely, uh, and create plants that can have humongously positive uh, productivity and solve world hunger or mm. resistant to pests without fertilizer. So it's all rubbish. Right. The technology, it's one of the most dangerous things. They're, they're working on gene editing uh, and uh, with gene drives, they call it, uh, of, of mosquitoes that have the potential to uh, uh, chain, alter nature, the whole nature chain. Nature is, is a, you know, a coherent whole. The interaction of insects with, with uh, uh, plants and, and uh, everything else. And this is not, uh, uh, you know, this is not proven technology. The U.S. government, uh, the Department of Agriculture said, oh, this is, uh, you know, pretty much the same thing as uh, uh, normal plants. So... <laughs> We don't need to have any uh, testing of this. Just let it out. <laughs> so, but then what, what they're doing is uh, they want to use uh, something called CRISPR Cas9 to change the DNA sequence of an embryo, sperm, or egg cell before fertilization, influence inherited characteristics, even of human beings. And this is pretty scary stuff, but this is the dream of the eugenics oh, uh, yeah. uh, neo-fascist crowd since uh, you know the Rockefellers got involved in the eugenics movement in the 1920s in the U.S. Yeah, no doubt about it, uh, Mr. Engdahl. Normal to the New World Order, certainly not normal to uh, you and I, and it seems like we could file that one under uh, the category of man trying to play God once again. Uh, just yeah. we, we see that across the board. Uh, one final question, and I'll allow you the last few minutes to kind of get off anything else uh, you know that's on your radar. We'll do a little shameless self-promotion time last few minutes, but I'm wondering what you're seeing, economically speaking, as being the future. We see in some countries... You know, there's an obvious war on paper. Uh, you know, you see Russia, China, some other countries moving moving away from the U.S. dollar. What What's the more viable future, do you think? Uh, digital economy, is it precious metals? There's obviously a lot of people concerned about, you know, digital economy and microchipping, especially from a Christian perspective. But what what, what do you see, you know, happening over the next five years? Is, is it going to be a push towards gold, silver? Is it going to be the digital economy, cryptos, whatever? How do you see things playing out? Uh, this is a big question mark right now. What's clear is that the the families who control the central banks of the world, starting with the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, are deliberately moving toward a classical boom bust, blowing out the bubble that they created back 10 years ago after the 2008 Lehman Brothers uh, pulled down. And now they are turning up the heat step by step, quarter of a percent by quarter of a percent. The Fed is raising interest rates, pulling back on the purchases of, of uh, assets from, from the economy and essentially draining dollars out of the global system. And what that's doing is creating first on a periphery in uh, vulnerable emerging markets like Turkey, like Indonesia, like uh, Argentina is a classic example, all the easy money that came in with such low interest rates over the last 10 years now is is going out. And where is it going? It's going to where the interest rate prospects are positive, namely the U.S. dollar. So uh, this is quite quite mad because the U.S. economy is, is not in great shape, but the, uh, the stock market is growing yes. like a bubble you can't believe. Right. So... <laughs> 
uh, where where does all this go? It, can they afford to run another 2008 uh, blowout that they use to regroup and, and uh, control more assets of the world? Uh, the powers that be behind the central banks, especially the Fed and the Bank of England? Or are they not able to do that this time? Are, are, it, I, I, to my mind, if China and Russia and Iran and a few other countries in Eurasia uh, were really clever enough, they would go into blockchain technology and create something independent of the dollar. Mm. They still, they're, they're doing that. They're poking around it, but they, they want to uh, kind of develop their own blockchain. Uh, it's hard to say at this point how that will develop. The idea of a cashless society is a, is a complete 1984 scenario. This is complete 1984. They're doing it in Sweden. Uh, Modi tried it in India. And he ruined his economy. Uh, yes. He did that on advice of the U.S. government, by the way. So uh, they wanted to make a laboratory experiment with India. Uh, so I don't think that's that's at all an alternative. But the, the, the funny thing is the nations of Eurasia and Europe and ultimately that could shift things in the United States, have the wherewithal, they have the human resources, they have the natural resources, the raw materials and minerals, the scientific labor force and so forth, to create anything they want. And money is something that's man-made. So they can, you know, you don't even need gold. I, I'm very, very... Uh, fond of, of gold myself, personally, as a, as a basis for a currency, which is what Russia and China have been doing over the last 10 years. But you don't even need gold if you do it right. Uh, you just have to have a strategy for building the right infrastructure and building up your economy independent of the, the dominant currency, the dollar. And it's, the dollar has been around as a weapon of destruction for much too long. Mm. People who created Bretton Woods were not the American citizenry, they were the banks of Wall Street, Chase Manhattan, Rockefeller, etc. And that system has pretty much created wars and, and ruination throughout the world over the last uh, 60, 70 years. It's, it's time we try something more healthy. Yeah, no doubt about it. It's hard to believe, folks, we're, we're, we're past our time here. So I want to allow uh, Mr. Engdahl the last few minutes here to get anything else that's on your radar uh, out to the public, if you would like, or some parting words. And if yep. not, uh, I always allow some shameless self-promotion time. So upcoming articles, media appearances, where we can find your books, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, I would just uh, mention one more time my newest book, Manifest Destiny, Democracy is Cognitive Dissonance. I think your listeners would find that an immensely enjoyable and useful uh, reading. And my website, if you go on to my website, williamengel.com, www, uh, williamengel.com, you have the possibility of uh, a free subscription to my uh, more or less monthly geopolitical newsletter to get a better idea of the content of some of my books and, and uh, also uh, deeper analysis uh, than, than the uh, periodical articles that I do weekly. So I would suggest that and uh, anything you can do to support uh, the work I'm doing is much appreciated. There's a support button on the website that you can click on and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so we all, we all need support these days, too. I know I've got to ask as well, uh, Mr. Engdahl, for uh, people to get behind this apostolate as well. So I hope you all enjoyed today's program. We, we try to get uh, Mr. Engdahl on as often as we can. Again, it's been some time since I've had him on the program. We'll have to get him back on uh, over the next two to three months. But I hope you all have enjoyed today's podcast for September 17, 2018. Folks, I've got Paul Craig Roberts coming on tomorrow. Uh, so I hope you all have a very blessed evening. And until next time, my good friends, stay safe. God bless. Take care now.